My, my job was to try and summarise the day and uh, look at that programme. I think you've had a great day. I certainly have. You've been a great audience. There's a few thanks to be made, of course. And I'd like to first of all say thank you to Georgia Diebel, who's not here. Georgia Diebel's one of the nurses who works with the prostate cancer charity, who's always been right at the heart of this, the desire to have a masterclass for clinical nurse specialists. Poor old Georgia fell off on a bike a month ago and she's not able to walk at the moment. She sends her love, she's texted us this morning, hopes you have a good meeting and we'll be texting her back to say it's all going well but we've missed her. So in the meantime, the thanks uh, really go to Lorraine Robinson from, from King's Hospital and also from Sarah Porch from the Prostate Ca Cancer Charity who stepped in to fill uh, Georgia's shoes, if such a thing was possible. I'll be brief in my summary. I think what we've seen today is risk stratification in just about every talk. Jim Catto did a great job this morning by telling us there were no new biomarkers on the horizon and we should get a bit more sophisticated about how we use PSA. And the stuff that's in the news at the moment, of course, is fantastic and we'll go back to work and everyone will expect us to have the answers. We will have risk stratified either by the patient having their genetic profile worked out and we know who the men are to target, or we'll say, get to the age of 60, have a single PSA, and if it's above two, we'll worry about you. If it's less than one, we won't worry about you. That is the message that's out there at the moment. And I think that's the sort of thing that I hope when you get down to your networking meeting, you're all talking about. How are you going to deal with next week in clinic when those patients come through the door? There's a bigger issue about PSA testing. It's easy for the, the well-educated man, the well-off man who knows about PSA and has his PSA measured, but we know there's a huge reservoir of men in this country who don't understand what the PSA test is, never have had a PSA test, and find they're having the PSA test done by the GP without being told about it. So we come back to the Prostate Cancer Charity's mission statement, and that is the call for uh, universal access for all men to understand what the PSA test is, for them to understand the risks and benefit of that test, and then to decide whether they have it. Claire Allen, what a great talk that was. Provocative, of course. And uh, I think that when she started off and said she thought MRIs were like fingerprints, and she put up an MRI and said, we can recognise the patient by their MRI scan of their prostate. It's a bit of a worry, isn't it? <laughs> so from there, everything else became even more worrying. All patients who were referred with suspected prostate cancer, i.e. a minimally elevated PSA in London, will get an MRI scan within a fortnight. Try taking that back to your trust. You will struggle. <laughs> but the evidence was good. And maybe that's the way forward. And when you look at what this meeting is about, it's about new directions of travel. It's where are we going and where will we be in five years' time? And do you know, I bet you the MRI scan is a lot more prominent than it is now. The other important message that we took from her was that the role for MRI staging after prostate biopsy is fairly meaningless. So if it's going on in your MDT, next time you see one, put your hand up and say, how can you say that's tumour extension beyond the prostate capsule? Why isn't it just bleeding from the biopsies that were done last week? And Claire will tell you, there's a study going on where they're doing MRIs every month for six months. Okay, 14 patients. But we'll know how long it takes for the effects of the biopsy to wear off for us to make meaningful statements about the role of MRI scanning for staging in localised disease. Um, Chris Parker, as usual, he kept us entertained. I was really pleased to know that the risk of dying from something other than prostate cancer was 30 times higher than dying from prostate cancer if you were in an active surveillance programme and over the age of 70. So really, we shouldn't be worrying these men too much. They seem likely to die from something else. And he did try and give us some clear guidance as to who we should do active surveillance on. He talked about the Gleason score and the life expectancy, PSA velocity and maybe the biopsy length of cancer. But I think we agreed at the end of the day that it's the patient who will actually decide it. We can know the science, we can advise people to the best of our ability, 
But then we take that information into the clinical setting, and that's why we're all doing what we do. We love talking to patients, no two patients are the same, and they will then hear that information and say, well, this is what I want. And that's a fascinating message. Bill Cross this afternoon gave a lovely talk on robots. It was a real warts and all talk. Um, I think we agreed that, that what's happened is a triumph for marketing rather than any evidence base for better practice. And whilst there may be advantages for the robot, there may be disadvantages as well. And the cost, again, a problem you're going to have to take back to your trust if you haven't got a robot at the moment. If you have, I put to you, every second patient you see with prostate cancer will have to have a rat a robotically assisted radical prostatectomy to pay for the thing. Yeah. And there's a way. Peter, sterling job on external wound radiotherapy. We know that the doses are now standardised. We know that dose escalation was a good thing and we know there should be universal standards of practice. But now we're asking the question again, should we be hypofractionating? Direction of travel for you. PRO7 study, great study, great answers. Six years after they start androgen deprivation therapy for locally advanced disease, what an easy message to give to patients in clinic. And then, the big message, I think it's clear now, locally advanced disease, you treat with a combination of external beam radiotherapy and androgen deprivation therapy. The PRO7 study says it, the Widmark study says it, and we know from the Boller study that's gone, but is now reporting its 10-year figures in the Lancet, I think the evidence is fairly compelling. Um, radionuclides, fascinating one that perhaps we'll pick up in a different stage of our discussions because we don't use it at all. Some of you use it a lot and I bet there's an in-between bit. I'd like to know more about why we don't use it in the way that we did. Duncan had the unenviable task of trying to tell us what to do with the rising PSA. None of us know. Matt came to his rescue and said, well, there's the trial. But I think we agreed, Duncan, that to try and set patients' expectations early is a good thing. There is a place for radiotherapy, and radicals may answer that question. And then the tricky thing about androgen deprivation therapy after that remains to be seen. But there may be a role for intermittent androgen deprivation therapy in those men to minimise the side effects from that treatment. Then Matt, what a tour de force. He went through scurvy, tuberculosis, right the way through to radicals, and he showed us the importance of a collaborative approach. And I think that will summarise for me the spirit of the day, because to see a group of clinical nurse specialists assembled from all around the country, thanks to King's College and the Prostate Cancer Charity, is only a good thing. And I'm sure the programme tomorrow will hopefully be just as stimulating as today. So thank you very much for your attention. Please go and network and enjoy a glass of wine. Thank you.